Namaste, Dave. Namaste, Bhagavan. Nice head rag. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's the cover of the bad hair day. Okay, well, I uh, wanted to talk with you today about a hint that I made last time regarding a nectar, uh, sorry, the uh, easy journey to other planets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I do this a lot. I'll drop a hint and see if anybody follows up on it. And nobody did. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's too important to just forget about it because it represents kind of the culmination of all of our work here. And, um, it, you know, it's kind of how it, how it starts is how it ends. You ever hear that saying? Yeah. Okay, so how it started for me with my Adi Guru, was that little book, Easy Journey to Other Planets. And uh, that started me on a journey which is still ongoing and which is going to take me to some very interesting places. <laughs> so, um, in the last video, uh, I dropped a hint that this knowledge, this knowledge, huh, is so big, it's so important, so powerful, so profound, that it can solve all of these problems of life beyond this life. Now, what does that mean, right? I was hoping to provoke someone to inquire, but I guess it didn't happen. <laughs> so anyway, okay, what does it mean? Easy Journey to Other Planets is about how to go to a, a different world, literally, by changing your consciousness. And, of course, that involves maintaining a certain state of consciousness up until death, or actually through the experience of death. And then that is what creates the next body. And now, with the knowledge from the Mandukya Upanishad about the four states of consciousness, we know how it works. And basically what happens is the state of sushupti or deep sleep consciousness is, well, it's Shiva. It's actually Rudra, the incarnation of Shiva. So when we go into that state with an intention then that intention automatically manifests. And, you know, how many times has it happened, Dave, that we're talking about something or even thinking about something and it happens? Yeah. It's kind so of... So many coincidences. Co coincidence. <laughs> it's not coincidence. Exactly. It's synchronicity. And synchronicity, really, if you break down the word, syn, S-Y-N, comes from like the same root of, of synchronous, which means together, working together or going together or something like that. And Kronos is time. Mm. And, and Isity is an instance thereof. So, Synchrona Isity 
is when when two things move in parallel through time. And so what happens when we enter sushupti with a certain intention is that Shiva manifests it. And this is very powerful. This is how you change your life. This is how you change your consciousness. This is how you change your world, your being. How you change what you are to become something else, something better. See, the Buddha said, becoming happens by tuning the mind to a higher state. And he used the same word, tuning, that you would use for like tuning an instrument or something like that. Tuning really means matching the frequency to a certain standard. That's what you do when you tune an instrument, A440. And you, you tune the instrument so that the vibrations match. Isn't it? So what are we doing when we're becoming something greater, something better than what we are? is that we're tuning our mind to a higher standard, a higher frequency, a higher level of intelligence, super intelligence. That's what I was talking about in the last video. And of course, we do that through matrix learning. That's the process, the step-by-step -step process. And we're going to release the matrix learning course soon, or at least the first part of it. But I want to go over the process that allows us to solve all the problems of life. Uh, and what is that? It's like this body is going to die. That is for sure. Everybody, whoever was, lived for a certain time and then their body, body died. Nobody gets out of it. Whatever is born will also die. That's the law. But consciousness is not born. <laughs> consciousness always is. So consciousness not only survives the body, but it's the cause of the next body. See, especially sushupti. The reason why we don't perceive anything in sushupti, like in deep sleep at night, is because sushupti is only cause. It's never an effect. And to perceive something, you have to be the effect. Uh, you have to be uh, perceptive, means to see through, per capio. So going back to the word roots again. So when we see through the mind and senses, we see the world. So when we're perceptive, we see the world. We become the effect of the world. And, you know, that could be good or bad, depending on the world. <laughs> so the problem is that we are in the human world on planet Earth, and it's not very good quality. You know, I mean, there are worse places, but there are much better places also. And, you know, if we have a choice, we would want to be there in the heavenly planets, in the planets of the sages, you know, in so many higher worlds. So the question is, how do we get there? We don't want to go to the moon, and we sure don't want to go to Mars, you know? No. <laughs> uh, these are dead places, uh, and they, they have no way to support human life. So where we really want to go is the higher planets, the subtle planets, the planets where, you know, there, there's a much better quality <clears throat> of life. 
much better quality of life than here on planet Earth. So, okay. Bhagavad Gita gives the principle. Uh, and the principle is uh, yam yam vapi smaran bhavam. The state of being that you remember, tiyajatante kalevaram, at the time of death, at the time of leaving the body. He doesn't call it death. He calls it leaving the body. Tiyajatante kalevaram. Tang tang evaiti konteya. Certainly, evaiti. Huh? Whatever, tang tang. Uh, that you remember, that, that state of being that you remember, sada tad bhava bhavitaha. After that, that is what you become. Bhava bhavitaha. That state of being, you become. So, what's happening here? The body is going away. The body is dissolving. The, the body is stopping its functioning. So we withdraw from the body into dreams, consciousness. And then even as the brain fails and so on, we withdraw into sushupti. Now, some people think of materialistic people who are used to uh, jagra or sensorial consciousness of the world, think that sushupti is the void, but it's not a void. Sushupti is pure causation. So whatever we are holding in the mind, whatever we're thinking of, the, the state of being that we are thinking of or remembering at the time of death is the intention that the seed that we carry with us into sushupti at the time of death, and that becomes the seed of the next body. So what do we remember at the time of death? You know, there's a lot of, been a lot of research on near-death experiences and stuff like that. We remember the whole previous life. It's like, all the impressions, all the experiences of the previous life are compressed into this seed, this mental, uh, like, like a compressed archive, like a zip file, right? <laughs> all the experiences that you've had. And of course, these impressions have a certain quality. They represent a certain state of being. And if our state of being is like mundane and, you know, nasty and lusty and like that, mm -hmm. then in the next life, we come right back here to planet Earth and we're born again in a human form, human body. And we have to deal with this environment, this same environment. So we don't want to do that. We want something better. That means we have to change the quality of the impressions. We have to change the quality of the experiences that we have, which means we have to change the quality of our consciousness to something higher. And how do we do that? Through bhakti. Mm -hmm. See, bhakti is the deliberate cultivation of consciousness of a higher world, a higher state of being. One becomes a servant of God in whatever form, according to one's taste. And like my Adi Guru used to say, the servant of God enjoys all the facilities of God, just like the servant of a king lives in the palace, eats the same food from the same kitchen, <laughs> right? Uh, wears royal clothes and so on. So in the same way, the, uh, the servant of God goes 
to the heavenly world and lives there with God or goddess or both. <laughs> and that becomes the next body. That becomes the... See, the body and the world are actually one thing. We perceive them as different, but it's actually not so. Because the quality of the body and especially the, the quality of the senses is what determines our experience. And the example is uh, a dog or other animal has very different senses and perceives the world very differently from the way we do. So, you know, if that's true of a, a human being and an animal, imagine the difference between the senses of an ordinary human being and a higher than human being. You know, we were talking yesterday about higher than human intelligence, that when you come across something, evidence of knowledge that comes from higher than human intelligence, you want to grasp that knowledge. You don't want to just let it pass. You want to do yeah. something about it, you know? That seems like, uh, I mean, actually, that's the way I've lived my life. <clears throat> searching for evidence of higher than human intelligence. And when I find it, because it's there, when I find it, man, I like latch on to it, you know. I told you the story when we were in Spain in, I think, 2011, 2012. And I found out about Paticca Samupada, the process of becoming. And, I mean, literally within two weeks, we had stored all our stuff and we're on a plane to Thailand <laughs> to go study this. Because it was obviously knowledge from higher than human intelligence that goes beyond the range and scope of human life and shows how we become what we are. Right, and so the, the Paticca Samupada is is good, but it's not the whole story. Paticca Samupada begins from Sushupti. It begins from primal ignorance, and then it goes into creation of Sankara, the mental fabrications. And then this, this is how the body is created. This is how the mind is created, the individual. So what comes before that is what we just discussed. Uh, one has to enter into Sushupti. And in Sushupti, one literally becomes Shiva. Actually, we are Shiva <laughs> all the time, but mostly we don't remember. And uh, when we go into this state with a certain seed, a certain, I mean, in, from the Buddha's point of view, it's a delusion because it's a conception of an individual existence. That's why the, you, you see the, uh, the temple carvings of the uh, Paticca Samupada, the, the wheel, the great wheel of Buddhism, in the center, there's like, it's like a yin-yang symbol, but it has three uh, dots. And, you know, uh, I, I don't know how to describe that form. You know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, it has three of them. Like, it looks like a teardrop? Yes, exactly, looks right. Like a, mm -hmm. With a dot in the center, like a yin-yang. And... Uh, so what those represent are three kinds of ignorance, primal ignorance, ignorance, delusion, and desire. Ignorance means we don't know anything. Delusion means the conception of the being an individual, a separate identity. And desire means I want this, I want that. So these three kinds of ignorance are the root the seed 
of the body. And that develops through 12 stages. And, you know, we've been over that a million times. So, uh, but how do we go into that state, you see? How do we get there? And how do we set up that state so that when we come out of it, we're in a higher embodiment? See, the Buddha also made reference to this. He said that when you practice these meditation uh, exercises that I give you, then the result is at, at the least a higher birth. And that could be a higher birth in a human body, or it could be actually what, what he was intending it was the higher birth in a higher planetary system. Higher than human. So how do we develop this higher than human intelligence? You see, we have to hang out with it. We have to associate with those who have this knowledge, who, who know this knowledge. And, uh, you know, mostly we do that through books, but we also do it through meditation, through bhakti, because God has higher than human intelligence. And God is accessible everywhere. So, you see, I don't agree with these, like, neo-Advaitans who say, well, once you know the truth of Advaita, then you don't have to do any more puja or sadhana or, or anything like that. I don't agree with that. And the reason I don't agree is that if you have the karma uh, to attain liberation, then that's fine, you know. But if you don't, you have to come back. And how are you going to come back? Are you going to come back in an ordinary human body on planet Earth in Kali Yuga? You know, I mean, we all we see the way things are developing. It looks really bad. Like uh, Zoe, yeah. Zoe was saying, uh, commenting yesterday on the on yesterday's video, or actually two days ago. She was saying, you know, I used to have like intelligent <laughs> discussions with people on the internet and uh, and in you know in present in you know was it IRL in real life <laughs> <laughs> i used to have intelligent discussions now it's not possible anymore and i've experienced the same thing and what's happening is that our attention is becoming fragmented by social media in particular, and by the internet in general, and before that by TV, and before that by radio. You know, why is a song on the radio three to four minutes only? See, because it fragments your attention. So, you know, if, if you look at a, any video, even a film, cinema film, it cuts every, like, 45 seconds on the average. Some even much faster. And every time it cuts, it breaks your attention. It fragments your attention. You can't hold one view, literally a view, a shot in a video. It just cuts to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. This fragments our attention and we develop a habit of fragmented attention where our attention moves from one thing to the next to the next, you see? But what is necessary for higher intelligence is continuous attention, concentration, to focus the attention on one thing and keep it there for an extended period of time. That leads to deep insight. That leads to higher intelligence. And when you have many such experiences, 
at the end of life, when the body is going away, that leads to a quality of being in the condensed memories of, of the life that is of a much higher uh, consciousness, much higher state of being than ordinary human life. And so you go to a higher stage of life. So uh, the performance of meditation, of puja, um, like study of the scriptures. You, you'll notice in the scriptures, there are so many stories of people sitting around having these long, deep conversations. It's like they have all the time in the world. And then the ancient world, it was so. Because people lived by agriculture. Their day was not broken up into going to school or going to work. They didn't have media, radio, TV, movies, or what to speak of the internet, to fragment their attention. So they were able to keep their attention on one thing for a long time. And of course, the conversations also went like that. So you have, like, for example, what recently we did this uh, Shiva Purana. Shiva Purana is like one long conversation. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Shonaka, Shonaka approached Sutta Goswami and he started asking questions. And Sutta just like wraps the whole thing down, you know, this like, what is it? 2,000 pages worth of stories about Shiva. Yeah, more books. It's not like they felt they had to take a break and go do something else. <laughs> Isn't it? So this is concentration. This is intelligence. This is higher than human intelligence. And so how we develop it is by following all of the uh, instructions in the scriptures. And then we get to, when we get this to reminds, the, huh? Oh, no, I was going to say, this reminds me of the conversation we were having where the questions that we ask and we send down to Mr. Shupi really, like, shape our life on the day-to-day -day and how that uh, process just applied to, like, the next life it's you scale it up what it is yeah you just scale mm -hmm. it up so this is the secret and and this is why for example we're encouraged to do, to uh, perform sadhana every day as a habit this is why we're uh, encouraged to get up early why we're encouraged to go uh a stay in an ashram, and so on, to get away from all the dis so, distractions. Huh? Is the non-dual deity and all the practice associated with it basically like a, a mechanism, a tool for you to take your consciousness and basically shoot to the loka of which that deity exists by like identifying continuously throughout life with like a non-dual um, entity exactly right shivo hum aham brahmasmi right tatramasi these mahavakyas the great sayings of the vedas are like little capsules you know little very highly compressed uh, condensed knowledge that keep us on this track and with the idea that we're going to a higher planet we're going beyond we're going to a higher state of being yeah. what do you think dave um one thing that really stood out to me is when you said that we return to shashupi we essentially are shiva and that makes me think about the causal ocean and how it's not a void. So, like, 
scientists try to explain like the singularity point saying that it's outside time and space and that they can't explain why <laughs> the universe came out to be but they know for sure that it came out to be so it just made me think like i i believe inside um the betas they give an explanation that says that one wanted to become many so in that sense like it seems like when we pass into the next life we always return back to this like original primal state of like full potential and i guess like the previous life conditions that to send it to whatever level it's going to go to like within this matrix yeah we bring with us that seed and when we enter into sushupti this becomes the basis of the next life and so i guess to a certain amount of uh there's going to be some um we're going to try to correct some of the shortcomings and uh you know, bad experiences that we had in the previous life. I don't see how we could avoid that compensation, Freud called it. Um, that like when you have a childhood trauma, a lot of times people spend the rest of their life trying to act out some solution to the traumas that happened in their childhood. So in the same way, uh, when we go through life and we have a certain karma, then we carry the seed into the next life of trying to compensate or correct the flaws of that karma. And uh, another aspect of it is we have to feel that we deserve to correct those flaws. Not that we have to go back and do it again. See, uh, that's called fixation or... Uh, obsession go back jack do it again no <laughs> we don't have to do it. we don't have to repeat the same mistakes we can learn from that we should learn from that and go to something higher in the next life but see to do that we have to be in a higher environment we have to have a higher association you can't rise above human intelligence if your association is limited intelligence. See, that's uh, another reason why sadhus are encouraged to go off alone. Lim limited as in like duality based? Sorry? Limited as in duality based? Well, just limited intelligence, like human level intelligence, mm -hmm. which would, yeah, it would be duality based jagrat consciousness and not seeing or appreciating the value of the higher levels of consciousness. I mean, in a sense, dreams are higher than uh, ordinary jagrat consciousness. <clears throat> because they have a greater scope of transformation, a greater range of possibility. You know, things can change in a dream just like that in ways that, that are surprising and, and strange, you know? Um, that doesn't happen so much in uh, ordinary waking consciousness, because the conditions in that state are more rigid. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of us like that. <laughs> we like the continuity. We like the um, predictability of sense consciousness. But it does limit our range of possible transformation. I mean, yeah. what, is, what is creativity? It's bringing dreams into reality, isn't it? And the idea is that dreams make 
things possible that, that don't exist. And so um, a great artist, a, a great musician brings realities, brings out these dreams into reality, things that didn't exist before. That's the meaning of art, art artificial. See, new, something that never existed before. So in the same way, we have to be able to dream and say, this is how I want to create myself. This is how I want to be, how I want to become in the future. Maybe I'm not, not that now, but that's okay, you know. I have this dream, to dream the impossible dream, you know. <laughs> we have to aspire to something. And it doesn't matter whether we attain it in this life or not. It doesn't matter. This is why, for example, in Bhagavad Gita, or any uh, scriptures on karma yoga, it said that we have to work for the divine, serve the divine cause without attachment to results. Why? Because if we work in a certain way and we don't get any tangible result, we feel like, oh, I wasted my time. I wasted my effort. See? and we become discouraged, and we drop it. But it's not about the work. It's about the attitude of serving God, serving the highest. See? And maintaining that attitude up to the time of death. Whether you get results or not, it doesn't matter, really. It's about the attitude and being unflinching in that attitude. Whether you get results or not, I mean, I mean tangible, material results. You know, So we shouldn't be attached to results, and that way we won't be disappointed if things in this life don't change, maybe they can't change in the way that we would like it, you know. But in the next life, possibilities are endless, completely open. Yeah, so it's more focused on the state of consciousness than actually what's going on, like your relationship with source rather than anything. Yeah, what is your relationship with God, with Source, with, you know, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> doesn't matter, Tao or anything. Um, what is the nature of that relationship and who are you in that relationship? See? Like I was saying last time, if you are a servant of a king, you live in the palace of the king, you eat the food of the king. So you live like a king, even though you're not the king, because you're in that world. So the same with, with a servant of God. They live in the same world as the incarnations of God. You know, wherever that is, we, it's hard to say where it is exactly, because it's subtle. It's certainly not a, a, a meat body on a rocky planet. Okay, <laughs> it's something be beyond that. It's more subtle than that. Is the natural process of this happening thoughts? Like thoughts are the things that kind of like carry us to manifestations, carry us into becoming a certain thing. Um, and then just contemplating, meditating on Shakti, meditating on Shiva. Um, is kind of like sending us there. So these things act like portals, basically. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And it's it's not about, you know, a certain God, like one God is better than another, God, you know. <laughs> it's about taste. 
and developing your taste, whatever that uh, personal idea of an ideal state of existence is. It, you know, it has to be done with heart. It has to be done with taste. Ruchi is the Sanskrit word for taste. Ruchi, rasa, also means a kind of taste, a flavor, a emotional flavor. Huh? Raga means an attachment to a particular flavor of emotion. So, like, what is your identity in relation with God? What is your relationship? Are you uh, kind of, uh, you know, adoring from afar? Or are you a personal <laughs> servant? Are you a friend? Are you even a, like a parent or a family member, senior family member? Are you a lover? See? How do all these relationships play out? What is your role? You know, like we read in Shiva Purana about the Shiva Ganna. The Ganna means the, the associates. And they have different roles. Some of them are guards. Some of them are soldiers. Some of them are personal friends, servants. You know, like Kubera. Kubera becomes Shiva's friend. You know, he has his own mountain, a mountain of gold <laughs> near Kailash, Shiva's mountain. See, so all these things exist in the subtle realm where anything is possible. If any, anything is possible, then what would you be? See, like there's no limits. But what is your dream? Yeah, you said once, um, I don't know why we come into this world, I guess just to experience. And I think in there, like, there's a lot. Like, we come here just to experience, and whatever we want to experience manifests. And um, okay. one of the conversations we had uh, previously was about the questions that we asked Shashupi and how they might have got us or even you to this life. And one of the questions was, um, I want to know God, or I want to be God, or what is God? And that can set up the, the parameters for like the life of a sadhu or a life for somebody who is um, trying to self-realize. And why is a good question. Why is life the way it is? You know, I came into this life asking why. <laughs> yeah. Drove my parents crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and teachers and priests and everybody, because they didn't know. You know, why do we have to memorize the multiplication tables, you know, teacher? Why can't we just use a slide rule or a calculator? In those days, there were no calculators. I mean, there were, but they were the size of a desk. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I use a slide rule? Why do I have to memorize these stupid multiplication tables? Oh, I got <laughs> so much trouble because of that. <laughs> but anyway, if we start asking these big questions... Then we get the big answers, or well, we're led to big answers, big views. Because a, a, an answer, a question, uh, a, a dialogue of any kind like that has to have a context. See, and what we're really talking about here is the creation of a context that leads to a higher state of being. Yeah. This is the art of becoming. It's the creation of a context. A context that uses you. <laughs> huh? That's the phrase that we developed for matrix learning. That how, how do you become a master? How do you become a genius? How do you become 
like, you know, the, the, the perfect, whatever it is you want to be, you know, if you want to be a sadhu or you want to be a musician or whatever you want to be, how do you do that? You create a context that uses you. And the nature of that context is such that it calls you into the being of whatever you want to become. Mm-hmm. It, ev- it evokes that state of being from you. It's like a magical incantation almost, you know? <laughs> yeah. I will be X, you know, whatever it is. Um, Aham Brahmasmi. <laughs> <laughs> See, these are magical incantations. They create a context where you are that thing you're trying to become. What The Christians have a, a saying. What would Jesus do? Yeah. <laughs> uh, WWJD. What would, <laughs> what would Jesus do? do you see it on bumper stickers so this is the question yeah if i'm brahman aham brahmasmi what would brahman do what would shiva do huh and to meditate on these questions is to create a context a background an identity where in any given situation you can manifest that being. See, what am I doing? I'm speaking as Brahman. I'm speaking as Shiva. I'm making certain assumptions, like the assumption that I can become anything, and so can you. I can realize anything. I can know anything. And so can you. Those are assumptions. They they feed into what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to do when I interact with you, when I interact with others. And to try to bring them towards that state of being where they can realize what you know their true potential is. True potential means being able to become whatever you want to be. And I think everybody wants to become great at something. Isn't it? Everybody wants to be like, I mean, ask any kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? They never say small things like, I want to be an accountant. (laughs) (laughs) You know? (laughs) No, I want to be a superhero. I want to be a a, a rap star. I want to be a <laughs> jet pilot. I want to be something great. Isn't it? What what kid, you know, worth the name, <laughs> would want to become a dental assistant? You know? That does that's not what kids dream about. Kids dream about becoming something great. So why do we give up on that? You know, well, one thing is that our our idea of greatness isn't great enough. And another thing is that we accept the limitation of a context that includes only this life. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we are going to exist forever. Get used to it. I used to, <laughs> ask, I used to ask people, what are you going to do with your eternity? You are eternal. Like, accept that. Now what? <laughs> huh? The Beatles have a song. Now that you're one of the beautiful people, What are you going to do? See? Now that you know who you are, what are you going to be? 
See, uh, I mean, they knew. They knew something. And the reason they knew something is they had actually experienced something beyond human intelligence. When several people work together so closely like one organism, you know, they say two heads are better than one. And four heads are better than two. <laughs> you know? So when this is like, you know, during the uh, heydays of psychedelics, you get several people together and you get high together and you trip together and you go deep into different states of consciousness together and play a lot of music. Music is like high velocity communication. You know, you you like start to think like the other people that you're with. You start to model them so completely internally that for all intents and purposes, you're an organism with four heads. You're, you, you know, you have more than human intelligence. You know, and this is one of the, the magical things about music and creativity at that uh, this is possible. You listen to any great band, you know, like Coltrane. My God, Thelonious Monk. Yeah. I, uh -huh. I mean, wow, you know, Whew. beyond. It's beyond. I, I think this is why jazz. By the, this is a side note. <laughs> this is why jazz <laughs> has has kind of stagnated since the late sixties and early seventies. After hearing Coltrane, it's like, oh, my God, where can we go after that? <laughs> you know, because it's beyond human intelligence. It's it's such a high data rate. And, and you know, the guy is playing in four keys at once. The group, the group is playing. The bass player's in one key. The piano's in another key. The saxophone is like modulating every two beats. How do you keep up with that? You know? Okay. So uh, when we encounter something that's beyond human intelligence, we can feel it. We can sense it. And so we should be attracted to these things and associate with these things and hang out with these things and try to absorb Try to understand or emulate what makes them great. What makes them beyond human intelligence? You know, how could I do something similar? See, when you start asking yeah. this kind of question, that leads somewhere real. Yeah, the questions that we ask definitely guide our life and the context that we put them in. A question implies a context. So based on the nature of the question, that implies the context, you know, you're invoking a context by asking that question. How can I become something beyond human? Oh, that question leads somewhere very interesting. You, you have made a comment. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You have, you have made oh, a comment. Um, I could talk all day about this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that this process is like happening all the time. And that really what we're doing with Noli is kind of like showing people this process, making them aware of it so that they can take control of it, so that they can direct it in whatever way that they want. And just off of knowing the process, you will reap the benefits. You know, I mean, like, mm -hmm. part of it also is, like, putting putting your all into it. Um, it. You know, it's only going to give you as much as you put in the mm -hmm. system. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. We are becoming all the time. It's not just a special thing that some people go off in a cave and do. <laughs> yeah. We are doing it every day, but we're doing it unconsciously. 
-hmm. We're doing it reactively. We think, oh, uh, the world is telling me I have to make a lot of money. So let me make all these efforts and make a lot of money. But wait a minute. What if your karma is such that you can't? You know, I want to be a beautiful movie star. But, you know, what if you're not beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the body is fixed. It has limits. There's a certain range of things it can do and the range it can't do. Yeah, you can expand that range by working on it. But still, it's always going to be limited. But the process of becoming is not limited because it goes beyond this body, beyond mm -hmm. this life. And that's like the super intelligence aspect that's happening like at all times, which is the world. Yeah, so if we change our consciousness, we change our world. The world looks differently from different states of consciousness. Huh? When we are awake, the world looks like, you know, the world seen by the senses. When we're dreaming, we have a dream body and the world looks different. This waking world disappears completely, gone. And we find ourselves in a different world that may be similar, but not the same. And, you know, sometimes people have recurring dreams or dreams that recur in a similar context. Mm -hmm. uh, and those may resemble one another, but they don't resemble anything in waking consciousness. You know? Um, certain aspects do, and the Upanishads say that we it's because we carry certain impressions into the dream. So the idea behind sadhana is that the impressions that we carry into the dream and into sushupti at night are of a higher level, a higher quality, greater intelligence than human. And we can access that intelligence through the scriptures. Yeah, I, I was actually um, going to ask: Does the Vedas does the Vedas have an idea of ontology? How do they communicate ontology? Because their their logic systems were like. They had way more um, values, like they had way more possibilities. Um, and it seems like they already knew about this knowledge. Like this knowledge is not new, like at all. Not at all. Ontology is, is embedded in the Sanskrit language. Mm. That's one of the astonishing features about it. Another astonishing feature about the Sanskrit language is that it contains an error correction mechanism. Interesting. See, yeah, Sanskrit um, poetry has what's called chandas. Chandas are meters, poetic meters. You know, like in English, we have iambic pentameter. Da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. Da -da 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 right? And so in Sanskrit, they have many very sophisticated meters. Um, so much of Bhagavad Gita, for example, uh, is in uh, one, one very common meter. And uh, if someone would alter the text, they would violate the rules of the meter and it would become immediately apparent to anyone reading the text. Mm, that's very smart. Yeah, so this uh, has saved the Sanskrit scriptures from interpolation and editing for thousands of years. They've been passed down exactly. Because if you copy a text and then someone goes and checks it and the meter is off, it's like, oops, there's a mistake. 
See, yeah, Whereas, that's high. That's high knowledge. It's very high, and it's so. You know, just like we have in computers, we have parity. Parity is a, an extra bit, or may, in some cases more than one bit, that indicates a checksum, whether odd or even. And if so, the the idea is if uh, anything changes due to like cosmic rays or whatever, <laughs> we'll we'll get a parity error and we'll know there's a, a mistake. We have to go back and rerun. So in the same way, if there's a mistake in the chandas, in the meter of the Sanskrit text, we know there's been some change, some alteration. Wow. This is intelligence. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is. Just thinking about um, the question that I asked, is Brahma, um, Vishnu, and Rudra like ontology, basically, in a way, or a breakup of a triple? Yeah, they're a triple uh, because they personify the three gunas, the modes of material nature. Brahma is passion, Vishnu is goodness, Rudra is ignorance, and Shiva is transcendental. Mm -hmm. He's beyond all three. So they are, they, uh, that is an ontological triple, that describes all phenomena in the world. And it's interesting, if you look into the definitions, that uh, actions in the mode of goodness lead to liberation and happiness. Actions in the mode of passion lead to suffering. And actions in the mode of ignorance are just are suffering from beginning to end. Uh, so then that's why the scriptures also recommend certain activities, which like even certain ways of eating, you know, everything aligned like programs. With, huh? Like programs. Yeah, it, it programs us to be associated with sattva guna, with goodness. Mm -hmm. And that leads to higher knowledge higher intelligence. Could, they, could this all kind of be like compared to like computer systems, software? It seems like as though like when we're little kids, we download programs that don't really work for us. And this is like a washing out of like all of the software and downloading new one that's going to get us to like a better browser or I don't know how you would put it. Control, alt, delete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three fingers salute. <laughs> <laughs> Reset everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's true. We are, we are given so many ontological constrictions, especially as children. Oh, you can't do that, Johnny. You know, don't touch this, right? You know, <laughs> bad, bad, bad boy, you know? <laughs> We're given so many uh, restrictions and rules. And and the, the most pernicious, the most dangerous are the ones that are subtle. You can't think that, you know? Or, oh, your imaginary friend is just in your mind. That's a really bad mm -hmm. one. You know, um, kids use their imaginary friends to compensate for the emotional problems in their family. And if, if we deny them, then they have no coping mechanism. They have, you know, so when a kid goes to school, and he starts talking about his imaginary, you know, uh, eight foot tall rabbit or whatever it is, you know, uh, and the people around him, and especially the teachers tell him, no, that's just your imagination. It's only in your mind. This does incredible damage. It stops the kids from dreaming. So it, it stops their creativity. 
all little kids sing little songs to themselves, isn't it? They all dance. They all draw nice pictures, beautiful colors. Why do they stop? It's because we kill their dreams with a, a lousy educational system. So it begins at home. The parents themselves start this kind of miseducation uh, at an early age, the infancy even. So, you know, uh, what can I say? There's so much that we have to overcome and reprogram. And, you know, the, the plant helpers like the mushrooms, the sacraments, the entheogens are very help helpful for this. But they only can erase the programs. They can't give uh, a new program. <laughs> yeah. We were talking about that the other day. Yeah. So the new program has to come from a source of higher intelligence like Vedas, like the guru, the realized master, whether through books or other media or better in person. Because mm -hmm. this is how you get the example. It's like an apprenticeship. Yeah. And uh, just to, oh, are, are we about to be out of time? We're just about out of time. Yeah, I'm looking at the thing. Does okay. Have time left? Two minutes. All right, you got two minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to bring up that um, I, I've even seen this in my own life, um, doing sadhana. Um, and doing mantras to Bria's body got me in connection with your videos out of nowhere. It didn't take a lot of time. So, like, uh, it is it is a practice that works. Um, you just have to be able to allow yourself to, like, get yourself there, unlearn all the things, relearn how consciousness actually works. And I think Noli is packing that together really nice, like, with a step-by-step -step process. Well... You're one of the authors. You you should know. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're going to spring this thing on the world pretty soon here, and it's going to be interesting to see how it comes out. But anyway, we are like out of time, and yes. uh, literally, we could we could and probably will when you when you come here talk about this stuff all day. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> and it should be recorded because it's all good. Yes, yes. Okay. Om Tatsat. Om. Om Tatsat. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Shakti Om. <laughs>